Okay, good morning. Uh, I'd like to continue basically where we stopped yesterday. And uh, before we go to some new things, I'd like to summarize briefly on a few slides what we learned yesterday, basically. So we <clears throat> were talking about, so the theme is interacting ions. And in the first lecture, you learned that they interact via the common vibrational motion. So that's our quantum bus. So we need to be able to couple the internal dynamics, the qubits, to the motional states. And that's what we did yesterday. So we looked at motional modes of harmonic oscillators and of internal qubit states. And we learned how we can couple them by shining in appropriately tuned electromagnetic radiation. And so that's how we make ions interact. And I want to summarize quickly what we saw yesterday. So we looked at our qubit states, two-level system, like a spin one-half. And these qubits are confined in a harmonic oscillator potential, described in this way. And then we shine in radiation, the radiation has a frequency, linear momentum, detuning, and intensity. And these parameters you can use in a proper way to control this interaction. That's what we saw yesterday. And uh, I just want to summarize this now in uh, some pictures. So uh, let's look again at our two-level system, which is now called GNE. And I just saw in Moro's note, he also changed between G and E and zero and one. In any case, so that's our qubit, G and E here. Then we have our harmonic oscillator states. And they can be the ground state, first excited state, and so on. And now we, this is our exciting uh, electromagnetic radiation that we shine in. And that's, we can tune it, and we tune it now to the resonance frequency of our qubit. So um, just that you have in front of your eyes the definitions of these quantities, I quickly draw again. So omega is the splitting of the qubit states. Omega L is the radiation. And then we had at our harmonic oscillator. That's the frequency splitting of the harmonic oscillator. What else do we need? Rabi, uh, omega is the Rabi frequency, the strength of the coupling. And then we have this phase phi of the radiation. OK, so uh, we tune the radiation to the resonance frequency of the qubit. And then these transitions are possible. We saw that in this case, our Hamiltonian, which is a pretty long uh, and not so easy to handle expression, shrinks down to a very easy uh, case. So it's simply rotating the qubit itself around the sigma x-axis. So we do not change the motional state when we tune to the so-called carrier transition. But we do change the states when we, for instance, tune to the so-called red sideband. So our electromagnetic radiation is now red, detuned with respect to the atomic resonance. And then we saw yesterday, under this condition and doing the rotating wave approximation, we find this Hamiltonian here. And here you see now that internal dynamics and external dynamics are coupled. So we create an excitation, and we destroy an excitation in the atom, and we destroy an excitation in the harmonic oscillator. And this thing is just doing the opposite. OK, and the coupling strength, uh, Oh, please observe this. It's, it's no longer the Rabi frequency. It's eta times the Rabi frequency. So remember, eta was this slam ticket parameter that measures uh, basically the momentum of, uh, of the radiation of a photon, the linear momentum of a photon. 
Okay, so that's the important parameter. If this lambda parameter is zero, then all the fun disappears. There's no more coupling between internal and external states. Then, you, then you're just left with uh, no excitation, basically. Okay, and then you can tune to the so-called blue sideband. So that's the, the other Hamiltonian that we saw yesterday. So this is called the James Cummings Hamiltonian, actually. So this was first discovered in uh, the context of quantized radiation interacting with a two-level system. And exactly, in the context of cavity QED. So when people quantize the electromagnetic field in a cavity, then it's uh, described by such a model, a two-level system, harmonic oscillator. Here, our harmonic oscillator is a mechanical harmonic oscillator. In the cavity QED case, it's a field. So we can realize the same Hamiltonian that appears in cavity QED here using a real mechanical harmonic oscillator. Okay, and then you can have this anti-chains Cummings Hamiltonian. I wonder this wiggling, is this due to the connection here or is this something intrinsic of the... afraid we have to live with it. Hmm. Okay, uh, so that's the, then the so-called anti-James Cummings Hamiltonian, and what you see is you create an excitation in your qubit, and at the same time create the excitation of your, harmo of your harmonic oscillator. So you go, for instance, from the ground state G with zero excitation to the excited state E with one excitation of your harmonic oscillator. So by changing, by flipping your spin, you can at the same time induce uh, an excitation of your harmonic oscillator in this case, or you can lose one quantum of excitation in this case. Of course, the opposite is always also true, so you can also go backwards, so uh, this, you lose one excitation in your atom and you uh, also lose excitation in your harmonic oscillator. So that goes back and forth. It's a completely, uh, it's a Hamiltonian with a unitary time evolution. Okay, so uh, now what we learned, we learned to couple a harmonic oscillator to the internal qubit states and what we really want is to have uh, several ions talk to each other. And uh, yeah, that's, I showed you this picture already, so we do what, we, what I just explained, and now this is supposed to move. I don't know why it does not. Uh, so we excited this ion, then the whole ion string moves. That's our harmonic oscillator now. So the common vibrational motion of all ions, the no a normal mode of n ions, that's our harmonic oscillator. And we can excite this and then couple internal, yeah. And as I emphasized many times now, this is the important parameter that tells you how well this works or if it works at all. Okay, let's uh, look at the same thing in a slightly different picture, which turns out to be very useful uh, for more advanced quantum gates. So. Uh, the, the picture is simply still two-level system and our harmonic oscillator, but now the harmonic oscillator is depicted in phase space. So this is the coordinate in uh, the position coordinate, and this is the momentum coordinate of our harmonic oscillator. And what we do now when we excite uh, this qubit or flip the spin, whatever you whatever way you want to think about it. Then what we do, uh, we give the harmonic oscillator a momentum kick, so we displace it from its initial, from its equilibrium position, and then the harmonic oscillator starts to oscillate around this equilibrium position. You convert 
momentum into position into momentum into position. So, yeah, yeah. So, how do I do this in the lab? I'll show you. <laughs> uh, we need a harmonic oscillator. So this is a harmonic oscillator. If, it's, uh, if you only have small angles of extension, so you have your harmonic oscillator. And what you do in the lab, you give your harmonic oscillator a momentum kick, and then it moves. So you turn on your electromagnetic field for a certain time, and then you uh, transfer momentum, and then your harmonic oscillator starts to move. So the kick is provided by the momentum of the photon. Yes, everything we assumed so far is completely coherent, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when we look at this harmonic oscillator here, uh, so just to illustrate this phase space, so we give it a kick, so we give it momentum, and then it, os so, and then so it has momentum, it moves, it comes to a rest. That's, uh, that's then, where did I put this? That's at this point in phase space where we have maximum uh, displacement from the equilibrium position and zero momentum. And then the game starts again. It's, it's going backwards, back and forth. And so in momentum space, this is just a closed circle. Okay, um, so I'll come back to this picture later on. I just want to mention this here. Okay, now, uh, and what we learned is basically the Hamiltonian, the interaction Hamiltonian, that's the interaction Hamiltonian, and this eta measures how well you can displace your, uh, in this case, an ion uh, from the equilibrium position. Okay, and now we come to some real, so this was so far completely general everything, and now let's look at some, <clears throat> sorry, some uh, real experimental implementations. So what do you actually choose in a real life? Also, Fabrizio's question, how do you do it in the lab? So you need to choose an ion first. And if you want a qubit, uh, you, Typically, so the first qubits were metastable states of ions and hyperfine states of ions, and I will illustrate both cases. So uh, for convenient ions are barium, calcium, strontium, ytterbium, where ytterbium not so much for this, but uh, more for the hyperfine structure. So, but calcium is a very popular ion these days, and it has a, the ground state, which is stable by definition. And then you have a metastable state that has uh, two quanta of orbital angular momentum. So there is, uh, and a total angular momentum of five half. So there's no dipole allowed transition here. That's why the state lives for a long time and is well suited as a qubit state because you don't want to lose your coherence by spontaneous decay, of course. Okay, and uh, now you can do everything I showed you by building a laser that can excite this quadrupole transition and uh, because we want to, everything to be coherent, <coughs> Uh, I, at several places, I already pointed out, we, the face of the light field must be kept stable. Otherwise, you just lose your coherence very quickly. And now, if you look at the frequency of such a transition, that's a typical optical radiation, 10 to the 14 hertz, a few cup, couple of 10 to the 14 hertz. <clears throat> so that's a lot. And let's say you want one second coherence time then you need to keep your, the phase fluctuations stable to one part in 5 times 10 to the 14. So this is a formidable challenge for an experimentalist to stabilize the frequency of an electromagnetic field source to one part in 10 to the 14. So then 
this challenge has been taken on by uh, several groups, uh, most prominently the group of Rainer Platt in Innsbruck, and they did great experiments uh, using these transitions here. Okay, and um, <clears throat> yeah, ah, yeah, okay, so this is again our Hamiltonian now only for qubit rotations, and you see that's the phase where it appears, and if on every operation you do, you have a different phase. This just amounts to defacing what you just saw on the blackboard in Mauro's talk. So you start with a density matrix that has off-diagonal elements, and if you average over many off-diagonal elements with different phases, they just disappear. So the coherence disappears if you do not keep this phase state. And this is, like I said, a, a challenge and has been uh, tackled by the group in Innsbruck. So this is one of their first demonstrations, I believe, uh, of this electric quadrupole transition using a highly stable laser, which was not that stable at this time, but I think today that's about the stability they have, the relative stability. And uh, if you look at uh, such laser light sources, they are very impressive. So you need to keep, uh, like I mentioned, you need to keep the phase stable. You have to have a high absolute stability of your frequency. So not only phase fluctuations, also frequency fluctuations, which in the end is the same, uh, have to be suppressed. And then you need a high amplitude stability because in your Hamiltonian, you have this Harvey frequency and this depends on the amplitude of your light field. So you have to control, you have to have exquisite control of all parameters. And um, so you need a very good beam quality of your laser beam. It doesn't, it's not sufficient to have some fluorescent lamp focused or something. So you need uh, very well spatial profiles of your beam. You need pointing stability of your laser. So if you look at this light beam, this is, has not a good pointing stability. <laughs> you see my, my hand is shaking, and this is amplified over this last dis large distance, of course. And if an iron were sitting there, I would have trouble hitting it exactly. So that's uh, what's pointing stability. And then you have diffraction effects on all your optical elements and on your vacuum apparatus. So this is, uh, to do this with high fidelity, it's a great challenge. And this challenge has been mastered by, uh, for instance, this group here. And um, yeah, and I want to show you one recent experiment from the Reiner Blatt group from the Innsbruck group, they did uh, uh, implementing Shaw's algorithm. So that's the slide I showed you in the very beginning of the first talk. And before I show you this, I want to point out that they do not use this Zirac solar gate <coughs> that I introduced. So this Zirac solar gate is uh, very useful for pedagogical reasons nowadays to explain how ions can interact. But the actual implementations today usually use different gates, different types of gates. And one of them is the so-called mölmer sorensen gate or sorensen mölmer gate, whatever. And this works uh, in a slightly different way. And I will not go into details. I just want to point out that this is the case and say a few, a few words that illustrate the fundamental mechanism. So you have two light fields now. So you have your two qubit states, both in the ground state. So this is uh, both qubits in the ground state S and your harmonic oscillator both in state N. And then you can excite uh, using two detuned light fields, this red one and this blue one going to, the, to this intermediate state where one ion is excited in the D state, the other is still in the S, or one is in the S, the other is in the D state, 
and those are the harmonic oscillator uh, quantum numbers. And then, so you can excite this way, or you can excite this way, or this way, and this way. So you have four interfering excitation paths, and the interesting thing about this gate is that the excitation of your harmonic oscillator basically drops out of the equation. So the nice thing about this Mölmer Sörensen gate is that you that you not uh, have to cool your vibrational motion to the ground state. So that's what we always assumed for the Zirac Zoller gate. So this is the advantage here. Okay, and uh, so now the basic operations that people in Innsbruck have is a global laser beam that uh, addresses all ions and does global rotations of all ions. So that's exactly what we had on the blackboard yesterday. The second ingredient is, um, okay, so this is the operator S phi, and this is a global rotation. So this is the time evolution operator using this Hamiltonian here. And then the second operation is a local phase shift. So you locally talk to only one ion. And this is a detuned light field. So all it does, it shifts the energy levels and thereby induces a phase. And that was a question yesterday, how can we do set rotations? That's one way of doing set rotations. So you simply change your level splitting by the AC start shift. Changing the level splitting means you change the precession frequency of your spin relative to what to your lab frame rotation and this induces a phase. Okay, so you can do global rotations of all ions, then you can do individual phase rotations, and then you do these mölmer sörensen gates. So here you see an S squared, so it's the interaction between ion I and ion J, so you get all kinds of cross terms. So it's an interaction term. Okay, so I'm not going to go into more details here, so but I will explain to you the spin-spin interaction later on. So just as an example of state-of-the-art experiments, so that's what they did now. They uh, recently, they implemented this Shor's algorithm, so they factored uh, the number 15, which is um, not easy in the lab with a quantum computer. So, and let me quickly uh, show you, outline this algorithm so that you can understand what this experimental result means. So, if you want to factor a uh, number n, so you, I just give you a rough outline of the whole algorithm. So, what you first do, you choose some base A, which is some number between 2 and n minus 1. And so you choose this randomly. This is a random choice. Then the second step is uh, you calculate the greatest common divisor between A uh, and N. And if this is uh, not equal to 1, then you already found one factor of N. But so the question is, is it equal to 1? And in a typical case, it is equal to 1. So you did not find a factor already by this random choice. And then the third step is, and so this is all classical stuff so far. And now the third step is you calculate A to the x modulo n uh, with x. being a natural number, or zero, and, um, and then you find the period of this, of this uh, function in x. So you find, uh, uh, find the first, well, I express it now in a 
not exact mathematical language, find the first x large or equal to zero such that um, such that a to the x modulus n is equal to one again. Okay, and then uh, and this is the then the period of so you calculate this when you find um, find a sequence of numbers and they repeat each other with a certain period and this period so this first x gives you this period r of this function here and then uh, you calculate yeah so and that's basically it so that's the and then you have more classical calculation steps and so the real quantum thing is happening here so that's the where we need a quantum computer, this calculating this and find the period. So these two things, that's what we need a quantum computer for. All the rest is classical com uh, computation. Um, okay, so the number of qubits you need uh, is to factor n. If n is a n bit number, then you need, for the usual algorithm, you need three n qubits. So this, um, and each qubit is a very valuable resource, so it's, uh, when you calculate this, go to the next larger number, then it's becoming difficult experimentally uh, because of this scaling which is linear but uh, still challenging so yeah. uh, yep uh, but let me since you asked this question let me point out actually what they did in this experiment so First, let's look at the experimental result now. So what we see here is exactly, so this um, base two, base seven, base eight, that's this random number they chose. So A is the space here, and then they look what their task is to find this period of the function. So they look at the output state of after they did their QFT, the quantum Fourier transform. So, so to find the period, you do a quantum Fourier transform of this function. And then they look at this output state, and you see this has uh, period two, period two, period two, period four, period two. So that's, uh, that's the output at this step here. And then the rest is, like I said, classical computation again. And now coming back to your question, so they did not implement this thing here. This is the classical Shaw algorithm. This is a variation proposed by Kitayev where uh, you take advantage of the fact that for this algorithm, your QFT doesn't have to be coherent. You only care about the population in the end. So you only measure the population but not the coherences. So this is particular to the Shaw algorithm when other algorithms that uh, incorporate the QFT, they rely on a coherent QFT so that you really keep track of the phases between your qubits. Here you don't have to keep track of the phases and that's why they could simplify this. So instead of doing the QFT on two n qubits, they do a QFT on one qubit two n times. So they do uh, what amounts to a QFT, which is just basically two sing single qubit gates, two conditional, well, it's conditional gates in the end. Uh, but you just do these two gates, and then you do a measurement, and then you do gates again, and, and so on. So uh, this is a simplification that allowed them to reduce the number of qubits. 
So, and now you're asking about the perspective. Yeah, that sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> In the lab, it's uh, not always easy. I mean, for such an algorithm, you need complete coherent control at any point in time and space. And this is uh, difficult with each additional qubit. So, but a way out is thinking of clever ways of uh, replacing algorithms by experimentally simpler algorithms. And so the, I would guess that the prospects to extend this to more qubits is pretty good. Okay, so the, the question of scalability, that's a, a whole lecture in itself, I would say so, <clears throat> but yeah. Okay, um, yeah, now I'm a little bit behind in time. So we saw this uh, electric quadrupole transition, and now let's look at a different thing, which is um, using hyperfine states. And hyperfine states, that's a very smart choice because they live forever, basically, on, the, on any time scale that you have in the lab. Typical hyperfine states simply do not decay, so they keep their coherence forever. And uh, there are several ions that you can use for these hyperfine states. And, um, but then you use Raman transitions, typically. And for these Raman transitions, you have a, an effective Rabi frequency, which is proportional to the Rabi frequency of this beam times the Rabi frequency of this beam, divided by the detuning. And then you have to take care that uh, your um, that this condition is fulfilled for the wave vectors of the two beams so that you can impart momentum on the ion. And this has been um, done, for instance, in the group of David Weinland for the first time. And uh, now if you think about how well you need to control your laser fields, you get rid of this requirement, basically, because you only care about the relative frequency difference between those two light beams. And that's much easier to stabilize than the absolute frequency. So, but you still are in trouble with all these other um, problems. So, um, this is also quite a challenge to do quantum algorithms using such a scheme here. And, but this has also been very successful for a recent example from the Monroe group where they implemented a five qubit programmable trapped ion computer. So they have uh, these five ions sitting here and then they have, the new thing here is actually is this a crystal optic modulator that allows you to focus uh, light, your light beam onto individual ions in an arbitrary way. And then you also collect, collect fluorescence using a multi-channel PMT. So that's the two new elements here in this experiment. And using this, they also implemented a QFT with five qubits. So that's the classical QFT, a coherent QFT, where you do all these C-not gates here or not necessarily see not, but conditional quantum gates between two qubits, and then at the end you measure them all. Okay, so that's a very recent example, and um, now I want to finish this part by looking at a slide that has been prepared by Dave Wineland. So this is a picture of the lab at some point, I'm not sure from which year this picture dates. Um, but so that's where some of these great experiments were done. And you see lots of laser stuff and lots of optical elements. So 
Some of you have probably seen such a lab. Who is an experimentalist here, by the way? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, so we are the minority here, clearly. So you probably have seen such a lab uh, in atomic physics, uh, cold atoms, or something. They look, on first sight, on zero order approximation, they look very similar. So you see lots of laser light, optics, and stuff. And so this is a pretty huge table with all this stuff. And then you see this iron trap apparatus far back there. So it's a large effort to make these experiments work. And these groups that I uh, showed you here, they mastered these challenges. But when you think about scaling, that's your question then it's kind of difficult to imagine how this thing can be scaled from two, five qubits to 2,000, 50,000. So that's um, probably not scalable in this way. Okay, so um, yeah, but you can never say never, of course, but it looks, uh, looks like a even more formidable challenge. Okay, so, and that's where this uh, new concept comes into play, this magnetic gradient induced coupling that I want to show you now. So that's, uh, I introduced this at the beginning, this nicely abbreviates to magic. And so I'd like to show you what this magic stuff is and allows us to get rid of all of the lab, basically, that you saw. Not all of the lab, I'm exaggerating. But all of the laser stuff that you saw on this, not all of the laser stuff, but 90%. Okay, so um, the important thing is we want to get rid of our lasers. And what I showed you is you need lasers because of the diffraction limit, because you want to address individual ions, and because of the coupling between ions and motional states. So you need this lambda -E parameter to be different from zero. If you go now, if you drive a hyperfine state directly, which has a frequency splitting of, let's say, a gigahertz or 10 gigahertz or whatever, then the momentum, okay, so we calculate this for optical radiation. What we end up with, a typical value is 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 2. You don't want to have it too large because then your expansion doesn't work anymore. You don't want to have it too small because nothing happens anymore. If you, so this is in the optical regime. If you look now at a microwave transition here, a radio frequency transition, for instance, in ytterbium, you end up with a value of 10 to the minus 7, basically. So this is, for all practical purposes, this is 0. So this is RF. So RF means um, anything from kilohertz to gigahertz. OK, so, uh, so that's why people did not use microwaves for this purpose here. But you can, use, uh, you can use them, actually, if you modify your uh, trap a bit. And this is shown here. So we start with our two states here. And we have our two harmonic oscillator potentials. So spin down, spin up state, position coordinate. And now we apply an additional field, a for instance, a magnetic field, gradient that changes its strength along the z-axis. So if we have magnetically field-sensitive states, this one might be have this dependence as a function of position, and this one has this dependence. And now if you add your harmonic oscillator, what you notice is, so let's, we start in, in the ground state. We excite now the ion, and so yeah, actually, oh, that's the wrong sequence of my slides. So what I want to show you here first is, um, so you have these 
spatially dependent states, and now you add your harmonic oscillator potential, and a linear potential, a constant force, plus a harmonic oscillator simply gives you, again, a harmonic oscillator, but sh with shifted equilibrium position. So what, what you see here, you have this equilibrium position, and you simply slide down this potential hill slightly in the upper state. So you, now you have displaced equilibrium positions of your harmonic oscillators, and now when you do this excitation, you see that you start at an equilibrium position, but you end up at a displaced position. So your ion will start to oscillate around this new equilibrium position, and you did not impart any momentum to your ion. So I'm not talking about any momentum here, I'm just flipping the spin, and I have this state-dependent potential, and then uh, this starts to oscillate around a new equilibrium position. And then you can show that uh, this, if you go through the mathematics, you find, uh, you can describe this coupling by an effective Lambdicke parameter, which is given by the shift of this equilibrium position in units of the extension of your ground state wave function. So that's this the set here. Okay, and um, now <clears throat> I look at this phase space picture. So the same thing again in phase space. So you have your um, spin one half with these position dependent levels, and you have your harmonic oscillator. And what you do now is you um, have your radiation that might carry some momentum, but doesn't have to. So you displace your harmonic oscillator along this coordinate, along the momentum coordinate. But what you uh, certainly do in this case, you also displace your harmonic oscillator along the set direction. And then it will start to oscillate around this new equilibrium position. And so, and this equilibrium, this is the shift of your equilibrium position, so that's a very uh, simple expression here. So you basically, you have your harmonic oscillator potential is given by one half m nu squared d squared, where d is the extension from the equilibrium position, and then your force is given by minus the gradient of v of d, which is just given by m times nu squared times d. So, and this force is equal to the force on the spin, which is, so this, uh, the force on your spin is also minus the gradient of h bar omega. h bar omega is your splitting between the two energy levels, and this is now also spatially dependent. So I'm just looking at the one-dimensional case now, so the gradient just amounts to a derivative with respect to d in this case along, the, along this direction which is called set here, okay. Um, so you just have um, h bar and d, d set of omega, and when these two forces are equal again, then you find a new equilibrium position. So the equilibrium position is just shifted by this amount here, and um, yeah. And then you can excite your harmonic oscillator simply by flipping the spin, and you don't need um, momentum anymore. Okay, and uh, yeah, if you go through the mathematics, which I'm not doing here, you can find this in these papers, for instance, then um, you see that you find a new effective Lambdicke parameter, which is called eta prime here, which is the usual Lambdicke parameter that makes this displacement along the momentum coordinate, and then this kappa thing here, which makes, uh, is, describes the displacement 
along the position coordinate. And this kappa is this displacement in units of your harmonic oscillator, ground state wave, wave function is extension. And then you end up with this Hamiltonian. And this looks now very similar to what we had before. So for instance, let's take the limiting case where the usual lamp decay parameter is zero. Then this red thing is simply zero, and then you just have a phase factor here, this i and this minus sign, and then you end up with the usual Hamiltonian that you had before, except that you have no momentum transferred at all. So, and this allows you now to um, do the same thing. How much time? Finished? Finished? Okay. So uh, let me finish by giving you a physical picture of what we did here. Um, oh, yeah. So before we had our harmonic oscillator, and we used a laser beam to excite it to give it a kick. And now we use a different physical mechanism. We have the harmonic oscillator, we don't give it a kick. What we do, we displace the equilibrium position. And it also moves. So if you look at a pendulum that has been described suitably for a few hundred years now, this seems rather straightforward, but to realize this in the context of trapped ions, that you don't need necessarily laser light was um, not completely obvious. Okay, so uh, let me finish here for today, and um, then I think there's one more lecture, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you.